I want to um, give you a little introduction uh, of Jean-Paul before he starts his presentation. Um, first of all, uh, Jean-Paul is part of our um, Metro Freight, our Urban Freight uh, Research Center um, collaboration. Um, he is a professor at Hofstra University, a professor of geography. Um, he's doing some really interesting work on um, home deliveries and e-shopping. Um, some of you may have been at the uh, freight conference last fall when he gave a really interesting presentation on um, Amazon's um, distribution network. Um, he has been using his own apartment building as a laboratory for tracking patterns in deliveries, uh, home deliveries. Um, Jean-Paul, I can only imagine what your statistics are going to look like <laughs> this year. And all of those things are really fascinating. But in addition to all this, um, he's also... Um, very well known, I'm going to say in a very internationally well known uh, for his expertise in maritime economics um, and maritime trade. Um, he has consulted with um, governments around the world. Um, he knows more than anybody, I think, on terms of um, trade flows and uh, the dynamics of those systems. Um, so I'm really thrilled that he was available today because usually he's in some foreign country, you know, um, giving advice to somebody or giving a speech at some conference. Um, but but Jean-Paul is now, I guess, um, at home along with the rest of us. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> so um, with that, uh, I would like to turn this over to Jean-Paul. Uh, thank you, Jen, for, for, for the introduction. Uh, indeed, uh, we live in uh, very interesting times, uh, that's for sure. And it is, uh, I would say, quite uh, shocking how quick things went down. And, uh, and uh, interestingly, I... I wrote a paper about 15 years ago with a virologist and we just, uh, in, our, in light of all the, uh, you could say the semi-scare that we got back then with the SARS, for instance, the West Nile virus and all of this, a lot of these sequence which recur on a relatively, you could say, regular basis. And so we sat down and said, okay, what, what about uh, supply chain and pandemics? And we start to do some research and we found out that nobody was writing, there was actually nothing about that and we were a little bit surprised so we decided to write a paper 15 years ago it was published in a medical journal and then uh, i keep updating this material from time to time and then suddenly uh, over the last uh, few months or so everything we wrote about uh, became a somewhat of, of a reality obviously the reality is always more complex than what you, what you envision uh, so these days obviously we are learning a lot of uh, lessons in terms of what happens in terms of trade, supply chain, uh, consumer behavior. And uh, in, some ways we're, uh, in some ways, we are lucky that this is taking place uh, right now because we have a lot of, uh, of technology that allows, uh, I, for instance, uh, I delivered last week, over the last couple of weeks 20 hours of Zoom lectures, uh, which allows us to continue gi giving, uh, I would say, uh, seminars to students. I could just barely imagine five years ago what would happen to a university semester uh, if we did not have that. Um, Plus also now the e-commerce is virtually these days almost a savior. We'll find out how resilient it is. Um, so allow me for the next, is it uh, five hours? I have five hours, Jen? You told yes. Me? <laughs> yeah, you okay. have five hours. <laughs> okay. I'm going to bore you, you to death. Don't worry. So you are going to get a new meaning of, of pain. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I should mention, sorry, I should, uh, that... Um, Tom O'Brien and Carrie Cartwright have generously volunteered to actually com make some comments at the end of your presentation. Okay, yeah. so I'm waiting for the flack uh, <laughs> to, to, to drop by. Uh, okay, so let's move on here with this issue. I'm gonna uh, divide my, my presentation in essentially two parts. One will be much briefer uh, because uh, essentially you have to see all of this in you could say two types of sequ sequential impacts of how uh, pandemics are hitting, uh, let's say, the, the global economy. Um, the, the first one is uh, pretty much over, is um, 
when we consider pandemics, when transportation and this transportation system is a vector, we have to look at this uh, in terms of propagation, which is excessively uh, interesting uh, in the sense that we are, like China, I'm going to mention about that a little bit later on, we are, I would say, cursed by our connectivity. That's a little bit of a, of a problem we are uh, facing these days. So uh, unfortunately, our transportation system allows for a very quick and sometimes uh, surprisingly quick diffusion uh, of things. So what we are actually find out, I would, there were some papers published a few years ago about uh, you know, the previous, you could say, scares or concern, uh, such as SARS, and they realized that most of the diffusion pattern was basically correlated to the network of, of air transportation connectivity of that specific location. That was very interesting. And I suspect when this is all said and done, it's pretty apparent these days that the diffusion pattern that we saw the current pandemic is linked with the, the, the connectivity of Wuhan in China. Uh, initially, of course, there are the, uh, several stages. So that's the first step, step uh, which is, has been amply discussed all over the world but I'm gonna give you a slight overview about that. You can unmute yourself and ask me a question if you wanna interrupt me at some point in time or raise your hand uh, or, or are, ju are we just waiting for the commentators at the end? Okay, uh, that would be uh, in a sense your call. So first step, connectivity, diffusion. Second step we're gonna spend much more time uh, discussing is what happens now when the, the fecal matter has hit the rotating device and essentially, um, how do you ensure a, con a continuity in freight distribution? What happened with supply chain? And uh, uh, again, I'm essentially learning as we go. Uh, I I've learned a lot over the last two or three weeks. Uh, even based upon what I thought was happening, I it allowed me a lot to refine uh, how supply chain are working when they are under a very unique, unheard of type of, type of stress, which we are going to to discuss. So let's begin with the, you could say the simple stuff. Uh, again, this is basic stuff. I don't want to spend too much time on that. Uh, what's happening, obviously, with all these factors that explain the, these pandemics these days. And the most important factor, uh, I think you can see my cursor, hopefully, is uh, global air travel these days, which is the, 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 the main diffusion vector. But still, there are other factors at play, which I mentioned here. Trade somewhat, again, there's some disease that may be spread as, with, through, through cargo, fair enough. You can link this with poverty. You can link this with war and conflict, international migration, and also, of course, uh, medical practices. All of these factors are all, I would say, converging into making, uh, making the world, in some ways, a fairly vulnerable place. But global tra air travel is, of course, the main factor of concern. And I find it very interesting. Um, I, I was looking at this. This is the, the classic uh, influenza cycles. Um, as monitored by Google, it published very interesting data about, uh, 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 in terms of web searches, it's, uh, sometimes it's more precise than the CDC because when people start to be concerned, start, start to be sick, the first thing they do these days is they run some keywords online. And then these keywords are kept up, are, are, are captured by search engine and it can basically monitor what people are looking at. And these days, one of the worst, it's the most uh, search item is, how do I cut my own hair here? That's, those are examples of the, of the shifting uh, pattern. I find that absolutely funny. How to make beer at home. <laughs> that, that's, a, that's interesting. So you, you can capture this and Google does that. And here you go. You have cycles, which are interestingly uh, correlated in some ways with the supply chain cycles to some extent. So there is some kind of interesting behavior when we look at this. But again, let's, let's move on. So this is in some ways the model, the concept I've developed uh, 15 years ago. Um, about uh, how pandemic diffuse uh, towards uh, a global transportation system. Uh, and I simplify this in, in, in four major phases uh, from emergence, translocation, diffusion, and, and the pandemic phase itself. And essentially, uh, what essentially takes place is obviously like any disease, uh, uh, the current pandemic has emerged in a specific location. We're not entirely sure about the epidemiology of it initially. Again, uh, there's going to be a lot of reckoning to come by, uh, but it takes place, it emerged under very specific circumstances. And based upon the connectivity of this location, it makes a huge difference in terms of how this disease is going to spread. So, 
So that, that's the problem we have with China. It, it, the disease emerged at a, at a hub. So instead of starting to see the emergence and the authorities start to notify it, we almost immediately were stuck with the face of translocation. By this, I mean the disease immediately moved internationally very quickly based upon the connectivity of you or Wuhan itself within China and Wuhan itself within uh, the world. So there was virtually very limited, limited time between the time uh, between the phase where the, the, the disease emerged sometimes in a, a remote rural area, which is pretty convenient. But in this case, it emerged in a highly connected hub. Actually, by mid-February or early mid-February, it was already too late in some ways. We did not notice it. And that's, that's unfortunate, obviously. And now, of course, we have reached the phase of pandemic uh, where it's pretty much across the board. So that's the issue. Actually, the disease is spread internationally first, surprisingly, and then is going to diffuse towards the, within the local transportation system. So that's pretty much uh, the concept, the theory I've, uh, I was putting forward a few, a few years ago about how can this work out. And it seems to be the case, but again, you, you, it, you can never me uh, very well measure the velocity, the diffusion pattern, which is linked with very, again, the connectivity of the place of emergence. That's, we, what, that's what we realize. Again, it's pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, so all of this, and that's the paradox. Again, you heard about the flatten the curve um, type of concept. We heard a lot, a lot about flattening the curve and all that stuff. Uh, unfortunately, of course, transportation plays against that. Uh, uh, you would like to push down the diffusion pattern, but the fast, the, the rapidity of modern transportation system, the dense city of most city, does the exact opposite. It pushed the other way around, and that's a problem we're facing these days because of hypermobility, because of hyperconnectivity, uh, quarantines tend to be less effective, unfortunately. Uh, so I don't know how we're gonna adjust to that. And here's, again, I update that. Actually, after update the United States, uh, it was 25,000 yesterday, it's, it, uh, sorry, it was 25,000 two days ago, new cases, it, yesterday it was 30,000. And uh, who knows where it's going to be uh, uh, today. We're, so we are, uh, we are in, uh, I would say, an exponential phase uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the spread of the disease. So um, again, uh, I don't know what to do with China. Uh, China is, I don't know, the liar in chief. Um, we're going to find out. But overall, um, what I've noticed so far is two major phases uh, in terms of the emergence of this disease. The first wave, which of course took place in China, uh, and we saw a surge here it's because they changed the reporting technique and I think they clamped down after that. But I assume this is way much higher, way much higher. But overall, there's not much we can do. China reports what it wants. And then uh, in the early February, we thought that this was done, that this was under control. So all of this entered a stealth, a stealth phase, which unfortunately, um, country complacent and then we entered the second wave which is we are right now, where across the board in the United States, I, I took some examples here where you, where you saw an acceleration. So there was some kind of an interesting uh, phasing of the process, but interestingly, this created a very unique type of disruption in supply chain. We first got some kind of a supply shock, and then uh, we are facing the second phase, uh, the demand shock. And in some ways we are, you could use the term lucky if you wish, that, uh, as technically China is recovering, it is capable now of it is restarting its manufacturing system and it, it, it is capable of exporting a large amount of goods uh, uh, in international market. We'll see how good it's going to be to do something like that. So in some ways, we're lucky that all of this was not completely synchronized. In that case, it would have been a much deeper trouble. Um, so we, we can, uh, we can uh, say count, our, count ourselves uh, can count our blessing regarding this. We can, we're going to find out how, about this phase, how, how it's going to unfold itself. The good news is when I look at Italy, Germany, uh, there seems to be a, some, a, an emergence of kind of a plateau. But the United States, uh, there's something. Uh, I can it's maybe linked with the number of testing. The more you test, the more you find out. But it looks like technically, statistically, we only detect one people out of 10, something like that. Uh, we're going to, again, as the epidemiology of it becomes well, uh, better known, um, we're going to get a more accurate number. But the more you test, the more you find out. Okay, so again, so just again, a little bit about China. 
regarding this um, China as uh, these days, because uh, that's why it's, we have so, so, much, so much of an issue. China has the curse of connectivity. And I start to um, look at things. The bad news is this happened during Chinese New Year where everybody in China was on the move because every, every year in China during Chinese New Year, something like 400 million people are on the move. And in recent year, the internal connectivity of China has skyrocketed in terms of domestic air travel, the high speed rail system. The, the last data I got is something like 615 million people travel domestically in China each year. 1.8 billion high speed rail trips in China each year. So China is becoming hyper connected. Plus you had this external uh, mobility. And again, 166 million Chinese tourists per in, in 2019. And I look at the data from uh, immigration in the United States between December and February of this year, 750,000 people, 50, 750,000 people have entered uh, uh, the United States from China, just to give you the, the range of this. And we talk a lot about the cruise. China has become the, larger, the second largest cruise market in the world. It was generated in 2019, 2.8 million passengers of cruise. That's uh, just the second after the United States. So all of this put together has obviously created a recipe for the hyper diffusion of something which is, I would say, quite uh, communicative. So, okay, so that's, that's the, the background in terms of the aspect. And now, of course, let's look at uh, the second phase in terms of what's happening in terms of supply chain and international trade. And obviously, we are learning that our strengths are becoming weaknesses, uh, especially when supply chain. When we look at what's happening in supply chain, I try to put here some kind of a little bit of a laundry list. Uh, I'm going to elaborate as it, as it move on. Of all the factors which, when you teach supply chain management, you, you, you teach people this is how the supply chains are working. They're becoming very efficient, but each factor of its efficiency, uh, when, we learn, when we see a pandemic, becomes a, a vulnerability. So you can think about uh, the consolidation uh, of supply chain, all the eggs are in the same basket, so we have a li very limited redundancy. So a strength becomes a weakness. We have applying economies of scale, and now we're learning that in air transportation, and particularly in maritime shipping, that as soon as you lose your economies of scale, uh, uh, companies go bankrupt because they cannot use these scale enough. So the maritime shipping company have been pushing for large container ships. Uh, of post Panamax, you know, uh, 10,000, 12,000, 14,000 TU. And now the demand is, has dropped by 25%, something like that. Again, we're going to get better data as we move on. Suddenly, their advantage of scale vanish. And the economies of scale itself, instead of being a, becoming an asset, becomes a liability. Same thing with airlines. They are no longer able to fill. So all of these issues, everybody who has scale, when they see a drop in the demand, is now caught with their pants down, essentially, and their profitability is, go is going away, excessively rapidly. So that's, a, that's something I'm very concerned about. We have, been a, we have built an international transportation system, which is leaning on scale, port operations, everything is leaning, uh, warehousing, all of this is leaning on scale. And as soon as you lose that margin by, let's say, 10, 15, 20, 25, 50%, you're gone. You, 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 you have a very, very difficult time dealing with this. So that's the second point where uh, things become a weakness. The third point I've noticed is obviously all this just in time, which is fantastic. Uh, when, it, when it happened is you realize that you have no inventory to play with. You have very little buffer. And suddenly, as soon as you get a, dom a demand surge for whatsoever, you cannot cope with it. And eventually the inventory disappears, vanish very rapidly, and the replenishment is not very readily forthcoming, which bring to the, the, to the, fir, the fourth concept is the concept of inventory and transit, which is also very co commonly used. And then you're now dealing with the immobilization of your inventory. Um, most of the hubs are congested uh, for very simple, re uh, for many reasons, but one of which is all those containers are, are, are not moving anymore. The truckers are not showing up. Uh, the, many of the purchasers have basically don't want to take, uh, I, I was having one of my students who was in the apparel business and he said, uh, our market disappeared in a matter of two weeks and all our inventory, we're stuck with it. Uh, so we don't buy it and, and we don't take, how can I say that, take delivery of it. So it becomes stock. 
and it and all this inventory is stuck. It takes warehousing space. It takes storage space. It takes uh, you say it has a footprint that you cannot easily get rid of. Uh, so that's I would say a fourth uh, vulnerability that supply chain are, are facing during a pandemic. And again, uh, within a few weeks or more, we're going to get we're going to get a very a much better idea of all of this uh, span itself out. And maybe luckily this is gonna recover very rapidly. So, so allow me to, um, uh, to show you uh, or to, to give you an overview of what I think is happening uh, in terms of, of all these shocks. Uh, it's um, the first shock as again, it was a Chinese production shock. It was a supply shock. It's a, it's a shock which was propagating. It was going, going from the supplier all the way down the supply chain. This is how it propagated now, in one direction, essentially, when China uh, started to have a very big demand, uh, decline in its production capabilities uh, because of the workforce was in lockdown. Uh, the industrial base by mid-January was basically disappearing. And immediately in some sectors, less than others, uh, we start to notice uh, uh, shortages. If you want to have fun, try to, buy your, try to buy yourself some headsets these days. Try to buy yourself some, camera, uh, some uh, video cameras. You, you won't be able to. All the, the, this is done, it's gone away in, in some ways. Uh, so you start to have this form of supply shock that took place. So that was the first step. Then what happened a few weeks later on, of course, we start to have a demand shock uh, of all the global derived demand across, across the board. That what's, what is fantastic about it is everyone at the same time. Uh, and that's, that was a, a very, I would say, significant. And it created among the supply chain now a back propagation shock. So you start to have a switch in a consumption pattern. And that's something which is excessively important. I'm going to discuss a little bit later on about that. And because it's a very big discussion these days, to what extent we have ordering and to what extent uh, the, the shortages are linked to something else. And the more time things move on, the more I think it's not ordering, it's something else. I'll explain uh, what I mean a little, bit, a, a little bit later on. So you have a switch in consumption patterns, which is across the board, which is basically having a very big stressing impact on supply chain. Uh, of course, the consumer base is now in lockdown. The commercial demand of everything has essentially vanished. Ev everything which is commercial demand is essentially gone. Uh, so that, that's huge for a while. So again, all the travel and touristic industry, people are now long on food, short on leisure. All, all, everything is there is of course uh, having an impact. And what we're starting to notice now is supply chains are becoming increasingly vulnerable based upon the labor component to it. And when you look at uh, supply chain, the closer you get to the last mile, the more labor intensive the activity is. Uh, and therefore, the more vulnerable it is to, of course, a, a pandemic. So that means that it's, it's going down to the delivery truck. The inventory could be at a port, at the warehouse, but you could start to have problems in the last mile delivery because people, uh, you start to have form of labor shortages or people are not showing up. You don't have the, the assets to move that to the last mile. So that's a little bit of my concern. That's the last mile is the most vulnerable, not because of congestion now. It's going to be because of labor availability and the risk that this labor has been exposed to. So that's what I'm afraid about e-commerce. It relies a lot on individual drivers. And maybe if we start to have a higher rate of absenteeism, no shows or concern, uh, this could have a very significant impact. But uh, we're not there yet, um, but it's still an issue. So that's the thing. It, this began uh, about, two or three, about three weeks ago, this supply shock. And of course, we all seen that, ordering which is a very interesting thing, I would say. Uh, what is ordering is basically when people are afraid about the availability of future goods. They are concerned that in the future, goods are not gonna be available, and then they hoard. They buy more as a consequence of that. That's classic. That's very, very common. We've been seeing that for a, a long time. Uh, and we observe that regularly natural disasters. And in natural disaster ordering is a very logical behavior because your concern is your local supply chain is going to be damaged. Uh, the warehouse are going to be damaged. The stores are going to be damaged, going to be closed for a period of time. And therefore, obviously, uh, you order for that reason. 
And the good news is, of course, when you have this type of disruption, you have a national supply chain, you have an external supply chain, which can adjust and re-gear goods in that direction. So it's pretty easy to cope with this. But there's a problem now uh, when we talk about hoarding. The whole distribution system is intact in some ways. Nothing has been damaged. That's very, it's very, very clear. But here's the issue. It's, not lo uh, it's clear it's not longer a local problem. It has become at the international level, at, at, at the whole national economy at, at, at once, people start to hoard. And again, they start to hoard because they're afraid that the, 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 the goods are not going to be available in the future, which is not necessarily true, uh, obviously. But that's the concern. That's why we started up. But then, of course, you start, you start to see a lot of stuff disappearing from, from store shelves, and it's very difficult to replenish itself. But now, more and more, we're realizing it that it's no longer because of hoarding that the stuff is not on, on, on store shelf. It's because the supply chains for commercial demand and consumer demand are not the same. And it is very difficult to gear a change in the supply chain. Here's what I mean by this. And I observe that in the restaurant business and all the way down to toilet paper. This is the, 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 it has become the icon of this. And you say, why is such a shortage of toilet paper? And we'll say, oh, because people are hoarding. It's not, it's not the case. They, have, they did a little bit. But the point is, there's nobody now in institutions. There's nobody at airports. There's nobody in shopping malls, in restaurants. So everybody was consuming toilet paper at, in, in, in an institutional commercial setting. The demand there uh, is no longer there. So therefore, they stopped demanding. And, therefore, and then the demand for domestic toilet paper, uh, among other things, has surged. But the production is not capable of dealing with this. Even though at the aggregate level, the demand remains the same, is the supply chain that we're procuring these goods is completely different. And the same thing for the restaurant business. The, the, the food providers for the restaurants are not the same than the food providers for the retail, the grocery stores. And therefore, the, the, the restaurant demand has essentially not vanished, but has dropped down substantially. While now people are staying home and going to the store, and therefore the demand for groceries increased by a factor of 200, 300% in matter of a, a matter of a couple of weeks. And they're not capable of doing that. They have a very difficult time to adjust their supply chain. So this is what we're observing. This is why, in many ways, why we have shortages, which is a very big paradox. It, as at the aggregate demand, the demand somewhat remains the same for essential items, although it has vanished for others. But the location, the channels of this demand have, I would say, completely changed. And the supply chain are not essentially capable of dealing with this. So now we are entering uh, the third shock, which is, uh, I call it the deferred demand trap. And that's something which is a, a, a very big concern for me. Uh, uh, for, uh, I will assume for the great majority of you as well. Uh, because we all know that the drop in the demand right now is in many ways artificial. That is, it is because people are immobilized, they're stuck home, uh, they only uh, consume essential items. The demand for apparel and other things and shoes has essentially vanished. So obviously, this has a ripple effect. I'm sure you, see the, you, you saw the unemployment figures, which are absolutely, I would say, uh, jaw-dropping. So here's what could unfold uh, very, very rapidly. So you have a decline in activity and income, and this starts to trigger uh, a wave of defaults and bankruptcy. Is you might say, okay, now why we don't have consumption. People are deferring their consumption. But this is what happening is now the great majority of people in corporation are living off their savings and their capital, uh, what they put aside. And the more time passes, the less future deferred demand you have. And the more difficult it's going to be to restart, a supp uh, to restart supply chain because the demand is likely not to be there. So the people who right now, over the last few weeks, who have temporarily lost their jobs, that temporary loss, which is, I would say, a few weeks, could become permanent as officially employers, stores, or whatsoever now declare bankruptcy because they can no longer live off their savings because their expense, their rent remain relatively similar. So they still have expenses to pay, but their revenue has disappeared. 
Same thing for people. They still have their expense, similar expenses in terms of cost of living. And of course, they consume less, but many of them, their revenue has disappeared. So therefore, as the more time move on, the more we don't have different demand. And this is going to rebalance supply chain, and this is going to push for protectionism in order to protect na 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 national production. Countries around the world are going to have all sorts of protectionist measure because they're going to say, uh, my, uh, my demand has vanished, and I want to protect potentially my national industries in order for this industry to be able to supply whatever limited demand there is to restart the economy. So that's a very, very big risk. The more this stage up, the more you would say you're gonna have some kind of a dual propagation. It's gonna get a continuation of the demand shock, which is gonna also become a supply shock as, a shock as well. So I don't know this is until it's gonna end. May, June, and if it goes on, we're gonna be in some ways in deep trouble. There won't be demand and there won't be supply in between. So that's a little bit, uh, some, somewhat of my perspective. And I try to, um, I would say, represent this in terms of what are the type of shocks in terms of, and within the supply chain about pandemic, uh, propagation, that propagation mechanism, and all the, the factors that I was mentioning about, uh, issues about trade restrictions, the lack of workforce, the huge substitution in the demand patterns these days, which are very difficult to cope with, to predict efficiently. So that's something we're gonna learn a lot about. And again, I'm very curious about the impact of this on e-commerce. Uh, we're going to find out. I think you heard the news that Amazon is hiring, I think, more than 100,000 workers to cope with the surge in the demand. But also what they've told, this was not that told uh, much in the news, that they told a lot of their suppliers to stop delivering to them because they're not selling some of the product anymore. And they're rebalancing their warehouses with, to face the shift in demand. So that's something which is really interesting. And obviously, when you have a transport chain, the closer you get to the last mile, the more labor intensive your, your, or your supply chain is, and the more, you could say, vulnerable it is to these, uh, to these shocks. Uh, so I'll make to show you some data. I try again, we, we barely start to notice. It's, it's barely starting to show up in some trade statistics. Uh, uh, I just got the data for February, March, hopefully within a couple of uh, few days, I'm gonna get more data about March. I expect, I would say 25, 30, 40% decline in our level of economic activity, but already uh, for the global the continental throughput index, it was down something like 10, 15% for February. Uh, Port of LA, 22% decline for February. I suspect 50% decline in March. Uh, we're going to find out. Maybe some of you are directly connected with uh, to the port. You can provide me more. I would say you can refute or, con or confirm what I just said. Uh, but obviously, we're going to start seeing this coming up. I have noticed, uh, I did not notice anything so far with the uh, Baltic Dry Index. Uh, if some, some of you have not, uh, are familiar with this measure. Uh, again, I, I'm not too sure what to make out of this. In some ways, it may be linked with the fact that it's very profitable to buy raw materials around the world these days because the, the price of commodities has, has collapsed and so, uh, maybe companies are restocking in terms of, of uh, iron ore or energy and oil. Uh, and maybe a lot of maritime shipping company are putting, are butt mauling their ships, their, uh, some of their tankers, some of their uh, ore carriers or whatsoever you're carrying. So that could be also a factor, but overall, B, but BDI is very low anyway. And last and not least, this one is the most shocking because you get it in more real time, the collapse in energy prices. Uh, lo, uh, so this is all the, uh, the variation of oil prices for uh, I would say something like 50 years or so. And the recent uh, weeks have been amazing in terms of the drop of, of the price of energy uh, to levels that we have not seen uh, in about 20, 20 something years or so. And it's still an issue. And it's gonna create a lot of trade issues on. It's paradoxical, obviously, obviously energy is cheap. Transportation is cheap because of the energy component, but there's very little demand for it. So that's a, actually, it's never been a better time to fly, paradoxically. Uh, but, over, but of course, people don't. So that's something we observe. And of course, since the United States become a, a big energy producers, uh, this is gonna create a lot of trade. Uh, 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 of trade uh, restrictions in the future. I suspect this is what commodity prices are gonna drive a lot of this action uh, because across the board, they are collapsing. Uh, that's something else. Uh, 
again, I'm, I'm not too sure. But that's something I'm, I'm trying to, uh, to try to articulate. Uh, it, it, what we're going to learn out of this, we're going to need to build what we call logistic strongholds, uh, areas, facilities that are designed as resilient to deal with these, these shocks. Uh, so that's the concept in terms, you have to identify strategic assets. It essentially make sure that these assets are capable uh, to function, to distribute things on, on a regular basis, even though outside is on, under heavy stress. So that's something else that might come out out of this. Um, the identification of areas and establishing strategies in terms of labor, in terms of, um, of fencing uh, security to make sure that irrespective of what happens, these assets are functioning that allow to the continuity of freight distribution. That's something, again, we can discuss. I'm still trying to articulate this concept. So please allow me uh, to move on with uh, some kind of a conclusion. Uh, and what I expect in terms of trade and supply chain uh, unfolding all of this. Again, this is subject to question and debate because we know, uh, we know as, we, as we, we learn as we, as we progress is, for my take, this is going to create a gigantic deflationary trend. The great majority of assets from real estate, commercial, uh, um, residential, uh, raw materials, consumer goods, all of this, the trend is going to be heavily deflationary caused by a wave of defaults. That's one aspect I think is going to happen. Even though they can print as much money as they want, I think the deflationary force is going to, are going to be likely stronger than all of this. Uh, because essentially you create uh, fiat currencies by its, its debt creation. If nobody wants to collect, uh, I would say, uh, uh, assume that it's going to create deflation in some ways. Uh, we, uh, all of this is very clear. It's going to create a renegotiation of all the relationship that China has with the rest of the world. We're going to lose a lot of trust with the world's largest exporters. That's becoming apparently clear. This is going to create a counter wave to globalization with, in a sense, a wave of protectionism, a wave of nationalism, and China is going to be facing huge international relations problem in the future. That's, again, that's my assumption. Uh, we'll, we'll see how this is going to pan out. Uh, obviously, the disruption and resilience of supply chain is going to be tested to ways which we never thought possible. We're going to find out how this is going to pan itself out. And I gave you in this presentation some, I would say, some of my assumptions, some of my views about all of these process of back propagation and propagation and all these shock which are taking place, which are currently testing uh, supply chains. Uh, the fourth thing is uh, we're going to get some form of rebuffering some form of 30 days rule or whatever you want to call it. Uh, all this concept of just in time, inventory and transit is going to be, I would say, re-questioned in the future. Uh, uh, a lot of people are going to learn we have to have a, a bigger buffer in all our inventory systems because we realize that when you have a situation of, of, of crisis or, or, or a little bit of a shock, you ran out relatively very quickly. So all the way down to people having more savings, uh, Corporation having, a, I would say, contingencies, all of this. I suspect we're going to learn a little bit about that. Again, I call it a 30 days rule. Could, it could, uh, could change some uh, terms. And then, of course, uh, another outcome is low commodity price are going to incite protectionism, especially from a country such as the United States, Europe, wherever, all across the board. Uh, countries are going to close their borders in, in many different ways out of this. And obviously, with, it was already beginning with automation with uh, higher costs in China, uh, all of this is gonna create a wave of acceleration of reshoring within a matter of a, a, a year or two. Uh, and of course, in the pharmaceutical industry, but pretty much in everything, uh, I would suspect many supply chain managers are gonna tell, okay, China is a risk. Uh, having a long supply chain is some kind of a risk. I want to build some resilience into this. Uh, I'm, I want to automate. I'm gonna redesign my supply chain, which, a, a, a higher form of regionalism into it to be able to have multiple providers in different regions and to deal more effectively with this type of, of risk and shock. Or again, I could say maybe we won't learn anything and things are gonna resume the way they were. I hope it's the case, but I suspect uh, it's not likely going to be the case. This is too much of a large scale event to leave, I would say the global economy, international trade and supply chain without any change, without any consequences. Um, and pretty much that's what I had to say. 
at this point in time. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to mute myself and I'll allow Tom and others to uh, comment, criticize uh, what I just uh, mentioned. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, <clears throat> I, think we, I think we can give a round of applause even though we're virtual. So everybody, you have to have, I hope you can hear it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, John Paul, for another shy and understated uh, uh, presentation. <laughs> um, no, that was really fascinating. Um, and I'm glad that Jen asked you. I know there's going to be lots of questions, so I'm just going to hit a couple of points that if you want to address them, some are questions, some are comments. Um, the first is the, the anecdotal um, evidence I've heard from the manufacturing side does reinforce what you're stating about sort of mid-March as being a critical date when, when buyers and planners would have started aggressively canceling orders and delaying de deliveries. And I, I imagine that there's going to be a fraction of new purchase orders uh, just placed moving forward. So maybe both for you and for Carrie when he gets on, uh, I, I guess that suggests that this, this round of activity that we're seeing at the, at the ports uh, currently, right, with the, the ships coming over are filled is going to be, is going to be ending at about the end of April to mid May. And I just would like some, just to see what your, what your thoughts are about that. Um, the second question and comment I had is about the, um, the supply shock you talked about it for a more integrated China, uh, not only internally, but one of the things that, you know, we've observed happening in supply chain over the past decade or so is a, is a diversification of the supply chains with China plus one strategies, um, meaning that there's a much more integrated Asian supply chain with Vietnam, with Thailand, Cambodia. And I'm just wondering, apart from the demand shocks that we're experiencing and observing here, what else can you say about the sort of integrated Asian um, uh, supply chain shocks that we should be looking for observing? Um, the other thing is, is in terms of, uh, apart from reshoring, I know one of the things that happened after the 2005 um, uh, lockout followed by the, the peak period congestions, we saw a diversification of port mixes um, being added into shipper strategies uh, in North America. And I'm just wondering whether you see any um, winners or losers in the port sector in North America uh, out of this. And then the last thing, just I'll, I'll comment on that as, a, as a, a student of sort of the institutional issues, I'm really interested in whether some of the laxing of the, uh, uh, the lessening of regulations like hours of service is, is something that we will sort of see come to an abrupt end or whether it will uh, create an environment in which we'll look at some of the regulatory environment um, it related issues and what it means for the supply chain as a, as a response to help it move forward. Um, and recover from this. So that's, those are my, those are my comments and questions. John Paul, do you want to respond? Yeah, no, uh, I'll, I'll give it a try. Uh, thank you, Tom, uh, for asking me questions I cannot easily answer. Uh, you're evil, man. Um, okay. Uh, allow me, uh, first of all, uh, about your expected surge in poor activity. Um, you're correct in a sense that all, again, the deferred consumption, the, de the deferred demand type of thing is going to play out in, in some ways. That is, that stuff is going to come in. Uh, all these orders are going to come in. I, I don't know if how significant or how long lasting. Is it going to be a matter of just a, a few ships coming in with all, full of cargo? And there you go. And then after that, the demand drops. Uh, I, I'm not convinced about that. But that's, that's definitely a possibility that you're going to get some kind of a, as, as China comes back online and as uh, obviously supply chain are running out of stock, they're going to be a, a resupply type of surge. But again, uh, in which sector is going to be? Is it going to be an apparel? I, I don't think so. Is it going to be, a, it's going to be Walmart, the targets of the world buying a lot of, and the Amazons buying a lot of stuff, but they won't be buying the same stuff. Uh, to, not to an extent. So we'll find out about this. So I cannot uh, easily answer, but you, you're correct in terms of, um, of a, a forthcoming uh, research uh, uh, surge, I'm sorry. Um, uh, reshoring, again, I already discussed, I'm not too sure what else I can add in, t in terms of, uh, is it gonna be uh, involved in diversification out only outside of China? But 
in that case, it's going to be an, a, a continuation of outsourcing and offshoring with a new twist and, and some form of a diversification of, of, of outsourcing across a, a range of country, or is it going to be a reshoring? Uh, that's that remains to be uh, answered. I don't want to clear again. It's going to be the different supply chain. They are going to respond in a different fashion uh, regarding this. And concerning the ports, that's something actually I was discussing uh, with some of my colleagues. Um, is this going to involve a diversification of ports? Is it going to involve a concentration or deconcentration? My take, my assumption, uh, is a concentration. Uh, here's why. Because maritime shipping companies are stuck with economies of scale. And therefore, they have not much freedom in terms of the allocation of their larger ships. And therefore, they concentrate their cargo and their route as much as they can along the biggest, the biggest hubs. And that could lead to a concentration. That's, that's my, I would say, uh, hypothesis. Uh, of course, the realities might turn out to be otherwise, but that would be, uh, I would say, what I expect could happen because of this whole aspect of mega ships, the, the post Panamax, now with, uh, which is impacting the East Coast as well. As well. It's going to be either shipping line decide to abandon a lot of big ships and they move back to their Panamax ships. Uh, that's going to be very difficult to do. The demand has asked to drop a lot to do something like that. But otherwise, they're going to essentially rationalize their service, concentrate their service, and say, okay, we're now entering mostly to the United States in those large ports, and we are somewhat curtailing down on services to smaller ports because we don't have enough cargo. And we assume that inland transportation system are going to cope with this. Uh, concerning, that's my take. Then uh, you were talking about labor issues. Again, this is going to trigger a lot of change in terms of safety practices. I, I was very happy this... Um, when this began, I, I'm sorry when I say happy. Um, what I mean by this is one of the recommendations of a paper we wrote 15 years ago was the transportation workers or warehousing workers, uh, people working at terminal, were not giving enough priority. They were ignored in the pandemic response plan. But now the first thing I hear or I heard when all of this was happening from the authorities is we have to protect our supply chain, warehouse managers, truck drivers are essential. So it, it actually really shows that uh, the, the, either the federal government, the state government, all the, uh, the, the uh, agencies realize, understand the importance of the supply chain. And that's, I would say, uh, a good thing. But still, I've heard stories from other uh, distributors that they were not giving uh, protective equipment to their drivers. They were not changing their practices. But this uh, is, is going to need to change. I suspect in the labor training per, uh, courses in the future, there's going to be a whole now lectures and elaboration about all of this pandemic uh, diseases, viruses, and how to deal effectively, all the way down to research how long a virus can stay on a box, on a shipping box. Some of you are, are careful when you open your Amazon boxes, when you, you, are you concerned? Because I heard stories, it could last a, a day or two on, on a package. So all of this, it could even change the design of packages. But I can uh, tell you entirely correct uh, labor issues and the training is gonna be a, a major factor in the future. That's pretty much the best I can say. I'll hand it off to Kerry. Okay. Um, bonjour, uh, Jean-Paul. Uh, bonjour, beaucoup. monsieur. Merci beaucoup pour uh, ta présentation. Uh, je suis Canadien, Anglais, d'Edmonton. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Mais uh, je suis un uh, fan de la Canadien de Montréal. Come, come to? They suck. <laughs> uh, sorry, everyone. We had to do little, a little plug for Canadiana and hockey. We do miss that. It's a world tragedy. Uh, a couple of comments I do want to make uh, and uh, some points that are uh, very poignant made by uh, Jean-Paul on the consolidation. Yeah, we, we've been seeing that for years, even before, obviously, this pandemic of, of consolidation of goods uh, volumes at ports because of the times of scale. We just had the first 23,000 TEU vessel um, in the Western Hemisphere um, call at the Port of Los Angeles yesterday. We expect another one the next couple of days. Um, and we obviously have been monitoring that for, very, for many years now. We will continue to see that. Um, fortunately, we think that uh, our ports, the larger ones, are capable of hanging on, accommodating this volume. Um, we cross our fingers. Um, related to the ports in the industry, another comment, um, interesting enough, the ILWU have had their first uh, reported um, 
COVID uh, case um, by someone who went, I think went to the dispatch hall, uh, which actually brings to mind of the change in practice and operations and not doing dispatching at a, uh, at a hall as, and doing it remote dispatching. So that's something we're gonna be looking into. Um, and uh, speaking of keeping the workers safe and healthy, which obviously is the number one priority uh, for everyone probably across the country, um, last week or two weeks ago, we were requested by terminal operators to obtain cleaning solution for them because they could not obtain that. And so uh, we spent days um, trying to procure gallons, multiple hundreds of gallons of cleaning solution that then we then obtained and then diluted in water and then distributed to the terminals. So they're using that now. Uh, but that is a significant issue. And actually, uh, Jean-Paul, I'm glad you mentioned the actual commodities themselves, the goods, because uh, sooner or later, that's gonna be a big fear of workers in supply chain. And how do we prepare for that? Um, and so that, that's an issue as well. And some sort of some uh, related to that, um, one of the things that comes to mind to me, and then Jean-Paul, I don't know if you've, you've started to investigate this with you, some of your colleagues, is uh, obviously the government sector at all levels, first and foremost, is the health and safety of everyone. But um, I think very soon, because of all the comments you made on the supply chain, um, I think the government has to take a bigger role in um, securing the safety um, and the resiliency of the supply chain themselves, such as making sure that the workers are protected with masks. And now we're hearing that everyone should be wearing masks um, if they're in public. Um, also, uh, the virus uh, is alive on inanimate objects for uh, one or two days, we're hearing. And so uh, something will have to be done sooner or later. And also to prioritize possibly different centers for logistics, um, not only international, but domestic. And uh, obviously, the fundamental goods we all use is um, primarily domestic produce. Um, so that is uh, probably going to be a serious concern to make sure that the products can be produced and distributed safely. Um, so I think the, the workers in the supply chain, um, that's going to be, has to be the next focus. Um, and uh, again, John Paul, I don't know if you've, you've investigated that. And on um, more on the financial aspect, the world uh, financial and geopolitics, um, it's interesting that obviously the U.S. government has stepped in and part of their stimulus is to provide billions of dollars for the airline industry. But uh, should governments think about that for the shipping industry to ensure these supply chains are maintained internationally? Um, I'm not aware of anything that other governments internationally are doing. Uh, we, don't, we only have two um, uh, U.S.-based uh, uh, shipping lines serving Alaska and Hawaii. And so would oh, the government awesome. even consider that for international carriers to ensure our supply chains are maintained? We do know obviously that Costco shipping lines is owned by the Chinese government, so they're probably in good shape. Um, and uh, uh, the Taiwanese government um, supports uh, uh, ever, evergreen uh, lines as well. So, so there's some comments and, and a few questions. So to, to talk about a consolidation, um, uh, it's, that one is really, really tough. And again, it's paradoxical. And that's what my, uh, the economy of, uh, of scale issue is gonna play up. It's gonna make a very important factor in the decision on maritime shipping line when they're gonna rationalize or reorganize their network services. And at the port level is what I suspect could eventually happen. Again, it depends how long this go on. If it's just a matter of a month or two, who cares? Uh, but if it goes on, it might force the rationalization as well within ports in terms of terminal operation. The closing down of some terminals, and the consolidation of activities within ports. Again, this is a matter, uh, it, 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 it's a time scale. That's a possibility. I'm sure ports are starting to think about that. And it's also an issue of labor. Do we have enough labor to make all these terminals operate in a safe way? And we're gonna we choose our terminal which are the best located, the safest, the maybe the most automated. All of this could be part of a very, I uh, would say, um, interesting uh, decision. Uh, so that's the best thing, I, best I can say uh, regarding this. The second issue was about the government role. This one is uh, giving me headaches uh, because every federal state agencies are wondering now, we have a, a, a pandemic which is not spatially uniform. That's very clear. It is impacting some hubs more than others. So therefore, how do we scale 
our resilience and we scale the reopening or the re-gearing up of supply chain in light of this. Uh, I, I can kiss New York goodbye for a while, in my opinion. Uh, we'll find out. Uh, but what about uh, Southern New Jersey, uh, where there's a lot of distribution activities, or in Pennsylvania? Uh, what about Southern California, uh, what, compared to Nevada? Uh, so all of this is going to reach, uh, uh, it's going to force a very important question. You're going to find to have a strategy to rephase, to phase this. You cannot have a national approach. It's, it's going to be crazy. It's going to be, okay, China is open, Japan is secure whatsoever, so do us accordingly. And we open a gateway, Southern California is a corridor, it's open, and it goes to these places because it, the labor force has been, become more and more available. While we avoid these areas for a while and we, we adjust accordingly. That's something. The sequencing is going to be a headache. And again, the sequencing is going to indicate you how resilient they are, how fast you can put back, them back online. We're going to learn a lot, a lot of lessons. The, the third question, or the ter that's, the, that's the best I can say at this point in time. Um, the third question, you were talking about financial issues. That, again, that's, that's a heck of a problem. Uh, because, of course, uh, most national, uh, no, most airlines around the world are somewhat, you could call them domestic. What I say, you know, American Airlines is, you know, it's located in the United States. It has an international market, but it's basically a domestic airline company. That's the bulk of the market. So it's pretty easy to find some support. But if you're MSC, if you're Maersk, uh, Hapag Lloyd, uh, <laughs> who, who backs you? Who, who do you come to ask for some support? Uh, and that one, I don't know. Uh, same thing with terminal operators. You know, if you're Dubai Ports World as opposed to uh, APM or Costco. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that, I suspect, it could become, in a matter of a month, a very highly discriminatory factor that could create really big trade or uh, international law issues in terms of who has deep pockets because of some form of state support as others. And therefore they are capable of getting some support and putting other businesses out of business because of that. Uh, we, know, we learned a little bit with Engine when Engine uh, ceased to receive the uh, Korean government support and went bankrupt because of this. But what happens if MERS cannot find financing or have difficulties Why Costco is fully funded that could create serious trade and law uh, conflicts, that would say. So we're going to find out. And you're entirely correct. Who can get money as opposed to who have more difficulty could be a matter of life. Not life and death, but could have, could have a very serious consequences in terms of who operator, who, whose actor can remain in business as opposed to who can good get out of business. Yeah, just a couple fall into that. Uh, uh, luckily, which may be a mitigating um, circumstances that many of these lines, although independent, um, are in alliances, uh, formal alliances, and share each other's terminals, which now most of the uh, shipping lines with some private equity companies uh, own the terminals. So um, they're sharing each other's uh, resources and hopefully that'll uh, mitigate some of the problems. Um, and just a, a, a point back on the government involvement in logistics, uh, just to, to know that um, our mayor took the initiative of calling upon our executive director, Gene Soroka, to be the chief city's logistics officer, which, which entails putting a task force together, which has been done to actually facilitate the um, provision of um, uh, healthcare, pharmaceutical goods, um, for hospitals and medical institutions um, in the near term and possibly that could uh, evolve into ensuring um, a fundamental goods, domestic goods, um, facilitating the movement of that uh, um, and finding out uh, who has goods and where it can be sent and how it can be sent. So we're directly involved in that now on the supply chain, uh, speaking of the government's role, and I think sooner or later uh, many states where they have larger ports, larger um, uh, industrial complexes such as Southern California, of course, and Chicago and New York, New Jersey, and Savannah, uh, will need to, I think, consider, especially since I mentioned earlier that we, you know, the LW already had one case of, of a worker um, going to the union hall. So um, more care is going to need to be taken to ensuring that the workforce um, is operational. Yeah, I cannot, I cannot disagree with that. Uh, th that, that's for sure. There are a lot, there are a lot of very qualified pr uh, professionals out there. They know how things work, and hopefully, they're going to be more and more drafted into uh, the planning 
process. They were involved in commercial and operations, but now they're going to be involved in the decision making at the strategic level. And that, and, and I would say, I'm very confident and positive about that because these people know what the heck, what they're doing, and they're going to make the right decisions. And again, I suspect we're going to find out that we are much more resilient than we think. Surprisingly, I hope so. Okay. E-commerce is already quite positive, I would say. Mike Christensen, I'm the director of operations and maintenance at LAX, and uh, Dr. Rodriguez, everything you said was ringing pretty true to what we're seeing. Just to, to give it an LA spin, um, we are right now at LAX 94% down on passengers. Oh. So we are about as close to being shut down as you could possibly get. Interestingly, uh -huh. we're about only about 60, 60% down on air operations right now, which means that we are at historically low load factors. Some planes are operating at less than 10% load factor. We've even had a few phenomena of passenger aircraft because so much freight moves as belly freight uh, around the globe and so many uh, schedules are canceled. We've seen some passenger aircraft moving with uh, packages in the passenger compartment yeah. uh, moving with no passengers. Um, with that, uh, we are consolidating terminals right now. Uh, uh, Delta is going to move out of Terminal 3 this weekend. Uh, United is going to move out of most of Terminal 8. All of our federal inspection stations, BP consolidated in Bradley and closed the uh, FIS stations at Terminals 2, 4, and 7. Um, the industry is reeling. I think you, you hit it on the head, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, you know, and uh, right now, as of this moment, about 55 0% of all the aircraft in the world are grounded. Uh, we're scrambling yeah. to find places to park airplanes. Um, we're really interested in seeing how the rebound looks. Um, we have several of the, the, uh, several of the international uh, airport organizations are tracking some scenarios. Uh, some of those scenarios don't look too good. Uh, some of the midpoint scenarios are showing rebounds that take us uh, back to less than 80% and not getting there till near the end of the calendar year. So uh, we know that at least one major U.S. carrier is potentially headed to bankruptcy. Uh, we also know on the airport side, and this, this is an interesting phenomenon where airports around the country, particularly um, the world in general, have been in a, uh, in a spending building binge for uh, five or six years to try to catch up with an infrastructure deficit. And that's put all of us in a, uh, in a significant debt mode. So what you see in the stimulus package that was just approved is a heavy emphasis towards debt service. And there are some major US airports that were unable to keep their debt service covenants with the precipitous drop in revenue they've seen. I'm glad to report that uh, LA World Airports is not in that mode. We're in pretty good shape. We expect to get about 350 to $400 million out of this package at LAX. Um, but we also know that this thing is gonna go longer than a lot of people in the general media are saying. So um, we appreciate, again, Dr. Rodrigo, what you, what you showed is ringing very true in the, uh, in the uh, airline world. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, what you just said is uh, quite shocking, um, I must say. Um, uh, so the, you mentioned the consolidation in terminal is also taking place at the airport. I was not thinking about it, but it makes complete sense if you are, you're facing a situation, you rationalize. Uh, your customs inspection or whatsoever and on the on the positive spin the only positive spin I, I can think about is we now have a tremendous airlift capacity for freight uh, if we need it that that's the best I can say uh, around the world you, can, you have all these airplanes that could be used if they need to be able to move a lot of stuff rapidly rapidly at, at, at whatever the cost there's, the, there's a huge airlift capacity on if you can find the pilots <laughs> uh, that, that's the issue, but that's the best I can say. Again, thank you for your comment. Uh, it's uh, downward uh, worrying, that's for sure. So the same issue in maritime shipping in terms of capacity, rationalization, financialization, they all, they all apply for the airline industry. Thank you, and good to see you all, and stay safe, everyone. I'm gonna- Oh, yes, thank you so much, Jean-Paul. That was wonderful.
Thank you. Um, and uh, just exactly what we needed to hear.